Well, this is exciting. We actually have a family law case recommended by publication uh, from the Court of Appeals. And as I've been complaining about for some time in, in flu, uh, we just don't get a whole lot of them these days, which is good news for litigants in that I think it means most cases are being settled. But bad news for somebody in the business like me who uh, 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 promotes and speaks quite a bit about new cases. Um, and it's uh, nice and interesting to have one every once in a while at least. So we have a new one that came down on February 20th. Uh, the case is called Miller versus Carroll, and it's 2017 AP 2132. It is, um, involves the issue of the use of Facebook by a judge, which is an interesting topic because you tend to hear a lot in CLE and discussions about Facebook and when it should be used and when it shouldn't be used. Um, and this case is a perfect example of the maxim that we all hear in law school, which is bad facts make bad law. And I don't think it's necessarily bad law. I think the Court of Appeals got it right. but. Uh, uh, I'm a little worried about it in terms of how far it's going to go. What happened in the case is there's a custody dispute between uh, Mr. Miller and Ms. Carroll, and um, the uh, judge uh, hears the case. He's from a relatively small county. I think it's Barron County. I have no idea where that is. And uh, he listens and takes it under advisement. He's going to issue a written decision sometime later. After he heard the case, but before the written decision comes down, Angela Carroll sends the judge a friend request under Facebook. The judge accepts the request and they become Facebook friends. Since that time, on several occasions, Angela liked a post um, on the judge's Facebook page and she a couple of times made posts of her own um, regard, and usually regarding some issue regarding domestic violence which was an issue in the contested custody action between her and Timothy. The judge comes down with his decision, and it's entirely in Angela's favor, apparently. And sometime after that, the guardian ad litem learns that the judge had accepted a Facebook friend request from Angela and tells Timothy's lawyer. Timothy Lawyer then files a motion before the court to reconsider based upon an appearance of impropriety. The judge uh, hears the, the motion apparently and says, no, it, it didn't influence me at all. I had my mind made up before I accepted her friendship request. I just hadn't put it into writing, but it made no difference that I accepted her Facebook request because it was after I'd heard the facts, I'd heard the evidence, and I already made up my mind. Uh, Timothy appeals and the Court of Appeals reverses. And the Court of Appeals reversal is premised on that concept of an appearance of impropriety. Court of Appeals seems to be concerned about several things. Um, and I think the largest is that Timothy, his lawyer, and the guardian ad litem didn't know about the friendship request or accepting uh, the friendship invitation until the judge's decision um, had already come down. Uh, the court, appellate court, discusses the concept of uh, ex parte communication, does not accuse the judge of it, um, doesn't say this was ex parte communication, but the fact that it discussed it at all indicates that it had uh, a concern about it. Um, the court's, appellate court's main, main concern um, had to view with public perceptions of our judicial system, and in particular, um, when one party does something during the course of litigation without the other party knowing it, involving a judge, and it's no place on any record, and is essentially private and uh, not confidential, but uh, private and the other side didn't know about it. And as a result, the Court of Appeals reverses the custody order remands with directions that it go in front of a different judge. A few comments. Uh, first of all, um, I'm on Facebook. Uh, I'm not a huge user or anything. I went on Facebook when my kids were in college and I told them that a condition of my paying their tuition was that they add me as a friend on Facebook and if they 
opened up a new Facebook account. I'm a friend on that, or they can pay their own tuition. Um, and uh, they decided for obvious reasons that they would rather have their tuition paid. And uh, those were my first three friends on Facebook uh, in order uh, uh, that I could uh, uh, see what was going on in their life, at, le at least somewhat. And I've stayed on ever since. And to me, the fun of Facebook is allowing me to keep up with some people in my past who have otherwise lost touch with. I have probably 20, I would guess, former clients. You know, you finish a divorce and clients aren't usually gonna stay in touch with you directly. A, they don't need you anymore. And B, you're sort of a reminder of a difficult, stressful time in their life. And um, they really prefer to black that out. On the other hand, we get very curious, at least I do, of what happens. We get very close to our clients and we get to know them very closely. I was gonna use the term intimately, but some people might take that wrong. We get to learn a lot of things about their life, sometimes more than we need to know for a very short period of time, and then they just sort of disappear. So it's sort of fun. I said I have about, about 20, maybe even 25 former clients on Facebook, uh, and they post every once in a while. I get to see how they're doing and how their kids are doing. I rarely post myself, uh, but it's, it's fun to, stay in touch virtually with some people who otherwise you'd lose touch with and have no idea of where they are, what they're doing, or what's going on with their life. And it can be done seamlessly without being intrusive or without reminding them other than accepting the friend request. And I usually let them request me as a friend rather than the other way around um, and, and see what's happening in their life. And as I say, I, I very, very rarely post anything uh, on Facebook. Um, uh, occasionally a picture of a new grandchild, that's about it. Um, I'm also friends with a couple, maybe three or four judges. Um, in, in each case, it's purely a social, not professional relationship, uh, where um, usually it's where the judge has asked me to friend him or her, and it's a judge who posts things about their professional life. One of them's a big sports fan, seems to think that um, if he doesn't post it, I'll never be aware that the Wisconsin Badgers are playing a game. Trust me, I'm going to know if the Badgers are playing a game. I don't need you for this, but uh, he seems to think posting uh, first quarter, halftime, third quarter, and final scores is really necessary, or otherwise nobody would know that. Whatever. Um, and um, uh, several judges, uh, and Facebook friends, with some of them don't post very much. And as they say, I don't post a lot. But I will guarantee you one thing. When that judge posts, or if I would ever post, it would never, ever have to do with a specific case or even an issue which could possibly affect a certain case. The Court of Appeals takes pains in their decision in saying that they are not establishing a bright line rule. I think they say it at least twice in the decision where it is not their intent and they're looking at the specific facts of this case in terms of making their ruling to reverse and remand. And I hope uh, people keep that in mind, because uh, I seem to hear a lot of seminars and a lot of people talk about how they'll never go on Facebook and nobody should. And it's, it's like it's some big evil thing that came out in 1984 where uh, by being in Facebook, you're you know, uh, uh, into somebody's life and you're doing all sorts of evil, wrong things. I don't really see it any differently than being a friend of a judge in a non-virtual setting. And I have a number of judges I'm friends with. Some of them I've even socialized with. And um, interestingly enough, it does me absolutely zero good in terms of their rulings. If anything, I think it hurts me because I think the judges bend over backwards to make sure that they're not perceived or, and they're not in reality uh, biased because of a personal friendship with a lawyer. I don't like the bend over backwards uh, to showing how fair they are, but there's nothing wrong with judges and lawyers being friends. There's nothing wrong with judges ruling on that case. Where this case went wrong was several things. Uh, number one was the fact that it wasn't a lawyer, it was an individual in a case. And uh, that in itself is, makes me queasy and very uncomfortable. Um, the second is that there was pending litigation involving this woman. Um, and number three, that the other side didn't find out about it until the decision was done. 
um, limiting it to those unusual factors. This case doesn't have any broad meaning or any broad holding that's going to control. And I hope people don't read it saying you shouldn't go on Facebook, you shouldn't have friends with uh, judges. Um, I do think it's judges should not be friends with litigants in pending cases, and I think that's about as far as this decision should go. But take a look at it, uh, read it, uh, send me an email with your opinions. I'm intending to write a column on this uh, next month for the Wisconsin Law Journal. Uh, please take a look at it and be interested to know what you think. And as always, for uh, the uh, hottest, newest cases and updates, we do have a, a, uh, each month either unpublished decisions or decisions from other states that directly affect family law, subscribe to Wisconsin Case Law Finder. It's a service uh, uh, of my law firm. Um, you could subscribe to it. It has uh, uh, 40 years of family law cases, uh, mostly Wisconsin, but also cases across the country.